As we begin, we just want to um, tell you that we've asked these students to tell their stories. It's, uh, it's not an easy thing to do to take an experience like they've had with a team in a service site reflecting on all the stuff that's happened. But we've asked them to boil it down into a bit of a story or some instant. Each of them will speak individually and then we'll spend the rest of our time with the opportunity to ask them questions, you know, the, your questions that go deeper. Uh, they're very touched that you're interested in their story. We're very touched that they're willing to share with us just how Creighton really works and the difference this kind of service does for them. So there are a few of them that have to leave and go to class, actually. So we're going to let them begin and uh, go from there. Hi, everyone. My name is Hope Beankop. I'm a sophomore nursing student, and I went to El Paso, Texas to kind of discuss immigration and like learn about it. Um, we are more of a justice trip more than service. We didn't do a lot of hands-on stuff, but we did learn a lot with um, the contact that we had with immigrants and also the other side of the spectrum with uh, law and court and stuff like that and Border Patrol. Um, so one story that I'm going to share that really touched me it was the first day that we were there, our coordinator with um, the organization that we were with took us on a border tour. And so the first thing we did was we went to this place called Rim Road, and it was a point in El Paso where you could go to this peak and kind of look out and see both El Paso and Juarez, and you could see the two cities together and yet not really know where one ended and when be one began. And she had to clarify where it was. And then you could see the river that uh, naturally divides the country, and it was kind of they filled it with concrete so that it was harder for people to cross it. And so just the distinction that we saw um, between two cities that could naturally flow together and the fact that our country tried so hard to separate them. And then right after that, we went to this other part of El Paso. And actually, we entered into New Mexico. And we drove up, and we could, we kind of parked on this sandy lot. And right there was the fence that separates um, Mexico and New Mexico. And this place was called Anapra. And on the other side, it was a Mexican community that didn't have any paved roads. And you know there were stray dogs running around everywhere. And so we were just kind of sitting there. The point was for the coordinator to share some information about the border and just kind of educate us. And then about 10 minutes in, some kids who lived in Anapra came up to the fence and we were on the American side, they were on the Mexican side, and um, they just wanted to talk to us. And so through the fence, they tried to kind of like play with us and try to talk to us and didn't really realize the separation between us and them. And they just really sat there and it was really moving to see that they lived in this community and we could leave and drive away whenever we wanted to, but they were kind of stuck there and they couldn't come over if they wanted to. And we put that barrier there. And the fence was so unnatural to what the environment was like. You could look, and it reached over a plateau, and it just went on for miles. And um, to sh see the separation between people that we decided that they couldn't be on our side just because they weren't born here, and they don't understand it because they just see it as a fence to climb on but we're sitting on the other side thinking if they cross it, it's illegal and they could be detained for that. So just kind of seeing the separation between people and that we decided it was okay was very moving and very hard to grasp. So that's my story. Um, I'm Megan Rill. I'm a sophomore in the College of Business and we went on our service trip to um, Birmingham, Alabama. And we were working with Habitat for Humanity. And um, when I was in high school, I went on a couple service trips with my <laughs> church at home. Um, and we were kind of doing the same thing, like building homes. But we were very isolated from the community. And um, this time around, we were the house we were working on was sponsored by Walmart. So part of the Walmart employee's um, job was to volunteer at the homes and really get a hands-on experience 
with their community and immerse themselves in important things like giving homes to people. Um, so this time around it was very different for me because I actually got the opportunity to talk to people who live in the community, not just work on a home of somebody who needs it. Um, so one of the days I was talking to a woman who was cleaning our trailer for us because there weren't like that many jobs because we were towards the tail end of the house. But um, I asked her what her favorite job she had ever had was and she told me that it was um, being a truck driver. And it was very interesting to me because for someone to, personally I would not consider truck driving a career that I would aspire to um, have. And for someone to tell me that that was their favorite job they've ever had and that it was the most freeing thing they've ever done was very challenging for me to kind of accept because that's just what she's exposed to and that was the opportunity she's been given. And for her to be able to look at it as such a positive thing in her life and to be so optimistic about it was really cool. And for me, it wouldn't have been a good thing. Um, being a truck driver isn't something I want to aspire to have but then so to just see someone be so proud of something um, regardless of society's judgment or regardless of like what society thinks is a worthy job um, was really cool but then on the flip side um, we were staying in a very um, kind of scary town and there was a lot of um, poverty and you know stealing and not very good habits and so a lot of those people we saw were um, very caught up in what society thought and they were kind of holding themselves back based on what they perceive society to perceive of them. Um, so it was interesting to see both sides of that coin and know that it kind of taught me that society's perception is important to some people but humanity allows for people to grow past it and not necessarily let that be the only distinguishing factor of their life. Um, so that, I don't know, I think that's my story, but, yeah. Hello, uh, my name is Brendan Smith, I'm a junior, and I had the unique opportunity to travel to Memphis, Tennessee for my fall break service and justice trip. My group spent the majority of our time over the course of the week helping out at Our Lady of Sorrows Catholic School. We each divided up into our own classrooms, and before I knew it, I was trapped in a room full of first graders. The first grade teacher assigned me to spend my time with two boys who were struggling in school and with their behavior as well. The story I'd like to share with you today is my relationship with one of those two boys, specifically and how this relationship helped me to see things a little bit differently. I didn't spend a significant amount of time with David until Tuesday, our second day of school, but it only took about five minutes after my arrival on Monday for our friendship to kick off. The class is lining up to go to lunch, so I stayed out of their way and stood in the back. Immediately, David latched onto my arm in a vice grip and led me down the hall in the direction of the cafeteria. I was shocked by this behavior, as I hadn't even said ten words to him at this point in time. So once in the cafeteria, I made a comment to our teacher about David's quickly developed affection. In reply, she explained to me how his father just recently had gone back to prison for domestic violence and about the insane custody battle that was occurring between the two parents. After learning this, this behavior suddenly made a lot more sense to me. David had never had a consistent, steady male presence in his life to look up to and to learn from. So although our friendship was only beginning, it seemed he had already placed me in that role, if only for a week. The next day, the teacher finally had me work with David for the day. Instantly, I understood his academic and, and behavioral struggles, and I knew it would be challenging to try to make a significant positive impact, especially in such a short amount of time. This first grade classroom had a system of grading students by their daily classroom performance and behavior ranging from E for excellent to P for poor. David's daily grade, I was told, fluctuated among the lower tiers, never quite reaching that E mark. So I made it my personal goal to get him at least one E throughout the course of the week. The first day I was with him, he seemed to be more interested in talking to me than paying attention in class. But gradually, with a little urging, David made steady progress. By the end of the day, he finally made it into the E section. It was very satisfying to me to see him so pleased with himself after his performance that day. David never went down from an E for the, re for the rest of the week, and I've never been more proud. And I've kept in steady contact with my teacher, and she tells me that even this, even this past week, 
he still hasn't gone down from that same E. His behavior towards his classmates dramatically improved, and he was more engaged in his class than ever. Watching David progress so rapidly and respond so well to my attempts to assist him was remarkable. It made me think about the amount of potential in this world that is hampered by a poor upbringing, in this case, it being less than ideal parents. From my experience in Memphis, I learned that it's absolutely imperative that kids be given the opportunity to succeed and realize their full potential so that society doesn't lose as many kids that, has, that have the opportunity to make a positive impact on our world. Leaving David and the rest of the first graders on the final day was extremely tough and admittedly a little emotional for me, but I believe I can rest assured that I was able to make a positive impact and hopefully enhance their desire to have a proper education. Thank you. I went to Stroud, Oklahoma, I'm Kyle Armstrong, I'm a theology major, I'm a sophomore at Creighton, and I went to Stroud, Oklahoma, and I worked with Habitat for Humanity to build one of the houses that they were working on. And what I'm going to talk about is the generosity that my group experienced while we were there. When we, as soon as, the generosity and the love that we, we were shown. As soon as we got there, one of the first things that we were told is, oh, we're so happy you're here. We love seeing you. We as Stroud love seeing Creighton come and help us out. When later on in that week, we found out that the person who was planning our schedule had gotten, there was, there's 21, 26 churches in Stroud, and all 26 of those churches were fighting to make us meals that week. <laughs> um, we also went out for, we also went out for a meal about six or seven times, and someone from Stroud had paid for every single meal that we went to. There was two, more, there was two mornings where one of the workers we had, one of the workers we worked with, the night before he had invited us to go to breakfast with him, and so we got up at seven, we, were at, and we, met, him at, we met him at the restaurant, and we had breakfast, and then about halfway through breakfast, the city manager of Stroud comes in, and he asks, hey, is anybody paying for your breakfast? And nobody, nobody said yes, and so he was like, I'm going to pay for your breakfast then. And so the city, ma the city manager paid for our breakfast. And then towards the end of that, the same guy had invited us out to breakfast again the next day. And he paid for the, our breakfast on Friday as well. And that was just amazing. We also, while we were working, we, people, either people from Habitat or the spouses of people we were working with, had brought us either Sonic or a box of donuts. <laughs> so one day we had about maybe 15 different like large slushies from Sonic. <laughs> and then there was one day where someone brought us, w one person brought us a box of donuts, and then another person brought us a box of donuts on the same day. And then on the next day, one of those people brought another box of donuts for us. So we ended up coming back to, o to Omaha with more donuts than we had left with. <laughs> someone had also, they were, they were having a breast cancer walk that week, and someone had paid for us, someone had paid for us to walk in this walk, and they, the, the walk came with shirts, so we have, all night of my group mates have pink glow-in-the-dark breast cancer t-shirts. And on Friday night, before our, before the, rivalry football game that was that night. Someone had paid for us to go to the, they, had a, they have a food pantry in Stroud that, ta that, has, that does their thing every other week. And Friday, that Friday night, it was their fundraising night. And so someone had paid for us to eat what they were serving that night, which was Indian tacos. Those are pretty good. And I was just amazed that someone would take the time to pay for all of our food and Stroud isn't, isn't exactly the most rich community, especially since there isn't a lot of money coming from government in that area. And it was just amazing to see that people would spend their money just to take care of us and love us as much as they did. Um, the person who we were building the house for even bought gifts for us too. She bought nine bottles of bubbles for us. She bought us and then that was, that was courtesy of one of her daughters. Her daughter had the idea to give us bubbles. And then her other daughter had the idea of giving us noise putty, like when you stick your fingers in it, it makes fart noises. Um, so she had, and she had the idea of buying all of us that. And so the mom bought us nine bottles of bubbles 
nine little tubs of noise putty. And then because of an event that happened with between me and one of the kids that I worked with earlier that week, I ended up getting the nickname of Baby Wrecker. And when I was writing my letter to the mom and the family before we left, I signed it as Kyle Armstrong, AKA Baby Wrecker. And when she saw that, she had the idea of buying me a candy pacifier. <laughs> and it was just amazing to see that even, even in her state of not being well off when it comes to money, she was still willing to buy us gifts such as those. And that was just really amazing to see. Hi, my name is Natalie Turner, and I am a junior studying exercise science in German. So I spent my fall break serving the community of Morton, Mississippi. Our trip was mainly focused on the educational system surrounding Mississippi. The Sisters of St. Francis in Dubuque, Iowa founded the Excel Community Center, which was our home base for the week. Excel Community Center provides tutoring, ESL classes, computer classes, and adult ongoing education. With our main fo focus being on education, we spent our afternoon helping the students finish homework assignments and work on their English language skills. During the day, while the kids were at school, we were given the opportunity to be in community with the students at the elementary and middle school. Through sharing cafeteria lunches and filling out worksheets with the students, we were able to live in solidarity and build relationships with the students, insofar as being personally invited to the 7th and 8th grade basketball game. Um, one of the most challenging and rewarding parts of the trip was working with an 8th grader named Diego. Diego was new to the town of Morton and came from an immigrant family, and he was just starting to learn English. With a major in German, I have little to no Spanish-speaking abilities. While walking around the math class, I noticed a boy struggling to complete his worksheet. When I walked over, the teacher quickly informed me that he was just starting to learn English and spoke only Spanish in the classroom. The teacher, oh, sorry. Um, so during the week in class, I used the little Spanish I knew, i.e. the numbers one through 10, to help Diego finish his eighth grade algebra. Through hand signals and a lot of thumbs up signs, we finished his worksheets every day. At the end of one of the class periods, as everyone was packing up, Diego spoke his first English sentence to me. He told me, have a nice day, Natalie. I was so touched. Even after the few days of me struggling to communicate in his native language, he took time to find the words to thank me in his native language, or in my native language. Through this trip and living in solidarity with a community unknown to myself, I learned that even if you don't think you have any gifts to directly benefit the community, language skills in my case, that even the smallest acts do not go unnoticed. At the beginning of the week, I would have never believed that my Spanish skills would have to be put to use, but I learned that even through a language barrier, you could connect with another person. My name is Emily, and I'm a senior in the College of Nursing, and I'm on core team and work alongside with Jeff, um, Wendy, and Ken in the office, and I could probably just talk your guys' heads off hours about how much I love this program um, and how great it is working with these guys. They're very inspiring and incredible. Um, so core team, what we do is we kind of like place these guys to where they're going. It's kind of a long process. A lot of like, are they friends? Do we look on Facebook? Like, so we try to place them with people they don't know to make new friends. So it's, um, it's, it's incredible. But for this past trip, I went to Albuquerque and our main focus was homelessness. We were in a shelter. Um, it was a big immersion trip. We stayed at the shelter. We slept on the floor. Um, we ate when the we ate when the homeless people ate, and we um, were dependent on meals based on what shelters were serving. So that was um, a little bit of solidarity, not exactly knowing what it's like, but kind of getting what it tastes. Is that you really have to plan your day on certain things. Um, a few stories that really stuck out to me is that. You know, Albuquerque is sunny and beautiful and hot, but that week, oh my goodness, the weather was terrible. <laughs> like, it was cold and rainy. And um, so the shelter we stayed at was just a day shelter. It opened at 7 a.m. And then when those doors opened, people would come in and they'd be wet and they'd be shivering. And um, I don't know, that just kind of became real to me that we are so blessed to have a roof over our heads. Sometimes we. Um, complain if we're spending the night away from home, oh, are we going to get a bed? Oh, we'll get a couch. That might hurt my back. But man, these people would be happy to just have a roof over their heads. So that's something I kind of kind of hit home for me. Um, another one was a woman I met. Um, she was um, elderly. And you kind of think of um, 
you know, your grandmothers or your great grandmothers having a lot of needs and assistance, but um, her on the streets was kind of heartbreaking, needing like a walker and whatnot. And she went to follow her son um, to Albuquerque because she's from a surrounding area because her son had drug problems. And that just kind of touched my heart too because I'm sure any of you have kids would, you know, do anything for them. I know my mom would do anything for me. So she followed him to like be on the streets with him to be with him. So that was also touching. Um, last story I'll say and then I'll, I'll be done. But um, I'm, I'm a senior in the nursing school and I met a man who was, who used to be a nurse, but lost his license because he had a DUI. And then just, he said losing that his nursing license was like the worst thing he's ever experienced. Just um, total identity change. He just hit an all time low and um, couldn't really function after that. And then is now homeless. So it just made me realize that sometimes I think um, our population can have a view of homelessness, make maybe they're scary or they're dirty or whatnot, but we're a lot more connected than we often think, and that's what really became real to me. Um, they're people too, and we're really not different from them. So, yeah. <laughs> I'm Caroline. Um, I'm a sophomore here at Creighton. Um, and about two weeks ago, uh, four other amazing women um, and I, we went to Clinton, Iowa. And we went to a place called L'Arche. And L'Arche is French for the Ark. And it's kind of based off of um, Noah's Ark. So L'Arche, uh, the L'Arche community in Clinton, and there are actually 18 other communities around the US. Um, it's a community made up of adults with and without intellectual disabilities. So um, I actually, in high school, went uh, every sophomore in my high school, we were required to do kind of a day service trip. Um, and I was assigned to large Seattle. So uh, I, there I met a guy, his name is uh, Robert. And he's pretty well known among the um, entire large USA community. Uh, what was really cool about him was he was like a really good artist. He built models of arcs, um, huge, huge arcs like kind of this big, this tall, um, and he also painted them too. And we kind of just spent a lot of, t oh, sorry. <laughs> we spent a lot of time in his room just like looking around and seeing all these arcs. Um, he didn't speak, uh, he communicated through sign language. And um, that moment, it was four years ago and I will never forget that. But now like fast forwarding to my service trip uh, in Clinton, the first night we get there, I met I met our like liaison person. Her name is Sarah, and she we were just kind of going through the like the paperwork <laughs> and whatnot, and she asked us if any of us had have had had any uh, experience with any other large communities, and of course I said something. And as I was talking about the man Robert, the artist, she kind of I, I saw her and she just kind of like shook her head and just went like this and. In my mind, I'm thinking, oh, geez, I screwed up already. Like, what did I say? Like, I hope I didn't offend anyone. And when I was done talking, she looked at me and she goes, I'm really glad you had a really good experience. Like, it's awesome to hear other people's experience um, in other large communities. But the man you mentioned, he very recently passed away. And oh my gosh, at the time, I didn't even remember the man's name, but like something hit me and I just got really emotional and I didn't know my group it was really awkward and I was just kind of just sitting there like bawling my eyes out it was really bad but like this is a really weird word to describe that moment but it was kind of just it was perfect um, everything kind of just came in full circle for me and it really really set up the entire week for not only myself but for my entire group um, we realized that like the large community can have a huge impact on somebody, no matter how much time or how little time you spend. I spent not even a day with that man, but I, here I am like four years later and I'm crying because he passed away. Um, and Sarah instilled the idea that the large community is really, really, really magical. Um, you're kind of just sucked into this community and like you just, you feel you're overwhelmed with so much love. And not only that, not only are you like receiving a lot of love, but you're inspired to love the way that they love. 
um, others unconditionally. And um, at the end of the week, uh, every night we did reflection with our group. And the last reflection, it was really emotional because I kind of just realized that with my time with the large community that entire week, I realized that I was like the best version of myself when my time was spent with them. And that's like something that you never really um, feel or you don't experience that. But once you do, you know, and I did. And it was like incredible. And I met so many amazing people that I like wish I could talk about, but I don't have enough time. But um, yeah, I think just like if you ever are in an area where they have like a large community, please like check it out like the, the they're amazing amazing people and they really do make create like a huge impact on you um as it did for myself and my entire group so yeah thank you Sorry. um so my name is kevin kelly um i am a junior in the college of business um, and i went to new orleans this past fall um, and so in new orleans um, surprisingly 10 years after um, Katrina still needs help. Um, so that was a huge um, realization just off the get-go that there could be people in need after 10 years of this catastrophe that happened in New Orleans and hundreds of people leaving but hundreds still needing help. Um, so we worked with the St. Bernard Project um, which was uh, um, home building down there in New Orleans um, and they have a hundred and 50 to 200 house waiting list um, just to get basic repairs done in their house and get um, back in their home after 10 years. Um, and so we worked with the Jackson family, um, which was a, a great project to work on. Um, but we had two site supervisors who kind of helped out with the things we didn't know how to do at the start of the week um, that we kind of adapted to um, in our four or five days working on the house. Um, and one particular experience that I had was with one of our site supervisors named Cam. Um, and I got to work on, uh, the last Thursday, I got to work on a full day's project with him of just kind of conversing and finding why he got into um, AmeriCorps and why he donated his time. Um, him being from New Orleans, um, he felt a, such a strong urge to the community and to his family. Um, that he decided to stay and donate a year of his time um, in order to assist with just a part of what New Orleans needs. Um, so I think what I really realized while I was down there is the strength of community um, and how fortunate we are um, to be where we're at right now. Um, but just, I think he is a perfect example of Creighton's men and win women for and with others. Um, and giving his time, um, I mean, he just got out of college. He's a 24-year-old kid um, with plenty to do in the world, um, and he donates a full year of his time to that. And that kind of just hit me um, in how strong the community is and how, how tight-knit that New Orleans is to be able to come back from that kind of catastrophe. Okay. Hello, everybody. My name is Ty Venzon. I'm a junior biology major in the honors program here at Creighton. And for my third service trip, I went to Montgomery, Alabama with going to Peru the first time and Chicago the second time this spring. And the focus of this trip was civil rights down in Montgomery. And I went to uh, Jesuit High School and I didn't really get a very full civil rights education. So going into this trip, I really wanted to challenge what I knew, what I loved about the United States. And I have to say, just like all the trips before it, this trip was an absolute eye opener. And the experience I want to talk to you guys about today was where we got to meet Mr. Anthony Ray Hinton, who was in the news about four or five months ago for being released from death row after being on it for 30 years as an innocent man convicted of a crime he did not commit. And we learned about this by going to the Equal Justice Initiative, which is headquartered in Montgomery, Alabama. It's a firm of lawyers who work together for cases that are impacted by civil rights, and they want to make sure that everybody receives a fair trial, is judged fairly, etc. And Mr. Hinton was not given this process. When he was convicted back in 1981, he was brought forth to I think it was the DA, and he was told that his jury will be white, 
His prosecutor will be white. His victim that will be giving the testimony will be white. I believe I mentioned already, but the jury will be white and his defending attorney will be white. And he was told that he would be convicted. It was not a fair trial and the EJI fought for 20 to 30 years to help him get released and just this year he was able to walk out a free man. And what this really spoke to me was uh, I am a very proud American. I love my country. And if there's one thing I adore and believe in, it's the freedom that every man and woman has to pursue their life, the pursuit of happiness, and to have opportunity. And that was stripped away from Mr. Hinton for 30 years. And to speak with him and to hear his story was nothing less than emotional and absolutely unbelievable to hear that such a thing could still happen after the civil rights walk from Selma, which I didn't even hear about in my education back in high school. Going into this trip, I didn't even know that happened. And being able to see that, being able to see the walk was unbelievable. And all I really have to say is, is that I'm very thankful that I was able to have this experience to come to Creighton and to go through the SESJ. And <laughs> It was nothing sh other short than it was just amazing. And I heard back in Peru, the main thing about college is it's like when you have a shoebox. You walk into college and the shoebox is perfectly fine, totally intact, but as you experience things, it gets beaten up, moved around, and cut up a little bit, but each experience has an impact on you for the rest of your life and you learn from it. And I'm very happy to say that my life has been changed by the SCSJ and what Crane has done for me. And I'm just very blessed and thankful to have this experience. Thank you. OK, we have about uh, 15 more minutes for your questions to interact with these students. Uh, incredible experiences they've had. Um, what did it do to you? What do you want to say to them, uh, either to individuals or to the whole group? And we'll get one or other of them to respond if your question is direct. So please, anybody have something you want to say or ask? From this, please. I have a question. Um, the staff at the How old were the children? Were they all children? Were they all children? In the Mexican border, how old were the children you dealt with? <laughs> and, and what are you wondering about in that question? How is it that they didn't know that? Um, so the ages, they varied. Um, there were some, there was one child that was about two years old, or, and then one, two that were three, um, and I think there were a couple that were about five or six. Um, and something that was funny is that like, we, kind of, we tried to keep asking them, you know, how old are you, how old are you? And they're just kind of like shy away because they were just kids. Um, and I think the main reason that we could tell that like they didn't understand, like they kind of, they understood that we were on one side, they were on the other, but they didn't understand the difference. Um, the first thing that they asked us before they like asked us for money or anything, because they were very much living in poverty, um, they were like, do you have any candy? And uh, actually our coordinator did, so she's like, yeah, here we go. So she just like gave them a Kit Kat and you know, they, they ate it and had chocolate all over their face. And so um, it was just very clear that they were just playing around and they just wanted to kind of like meet new people and um, we were worried, you know, about their safety and like when we were standing there we heard gunshots. Um, but they were just kind of like, that's what they live in every day and that's what they have to go through. So they just didn't really understand. I don't have a question. I just have a, wow, you guys are awesome. And, um, this is Creighton. I mean, I'm just like so filled with pride and I don't even know any of you <laughs> personally, but wow, I'm so impressed and I'm touched by your ability to see the differences and reflect on them and really be honest about how you're touched by your experience. I'm also very sad that you didn't know about Selma. <laughs> and unfortunately, so that I. says how old I am because those were sort of the things going on when I was growing up and it was like all over the news. And, and so it's, that opens my mind to goodness, I'm assuming 
you're learning those things and everyone isn't. And so thank you very much for sharing. Just wonderful. Thank you. Thank you very much. Please. Um, this might be more for the coordinator. Um, how does Create and pick the sites that students go to? We reach out to sites through like organizations with um, like religious affiliations, sometimes conferences. Like we reach out to sites who we think, or we just want to know who would like to have students, and then they reciprocate, saying yes, we would like to have students. No, we wouldn't. We don't like force ourselves to go or anything like that. Um, and then there's sites that we've gone to for many years, like Stroud. We have a really good relationship with Stroud. We've been going there for. I don't know, like 18 years, some some number some number of years. Um, so we basically we reach out a lot of reach out through um, Ke Kelly does a lot of that. She's back there in the purple, um, and with like Jesuits and other connections we have at Creighton. Um, we had a trip to I mm, I think Mon one of the Montgomery trips like failed last minute, and then Kevin Cool somehow got us to go to. Memphis, so that was that was really awesome. Just um, yeah. So did that answer your question? I don't know. <laughs> yeah. So we just base it off if people hosts would like to have students, and then that's how we that's how we do it. So. Can I ask how are you prepared for this? What what goes? Some of you have been through a couple. Of, what what gets you ready to be this open to this experience? There's a couple meetings that we go to beforehand to kind of prepare us for what we might see and get us in the mindset for uh, the different pillars like simplicity and sustainability and those kind of things, just kind of to get our minds going on what we need to be looking for in order to get the most fulfilling experience out of our trip here. Um, and then when you when the day comes where you leave, I was kind of unprepared for what I was going to experience just because I've never been to Alabama. Um, so nobody really knows exactly what you're going to go through. So there's not, they prepare you as well as they can, but everybody has such individual experiences that there's no way to prepare everybody for everything they're going to experience. Um, I don't know if that answered the question, but. Yeah, that's great. Okay. <laughs> Please, Joan. Uh, I think it was Carolyn. Several of you, you definitely mentioned reflection. Can you tell us what that means to you now? Could you come up here, Carolyn, to talk about what reflection <coughs> means to you? And I'm asking this question because I think a lot of us who are older have never been trained how to reflect, and that that is one of the beauties of this program. Okay. Yeah, um, I think, well, with being um, in an edu a Jesuit education uh, since high school, reflection is a huge, huge aspect. Um, just among the Jesuits, um, we kind of just reflect on what we did that day, um, how we felt afterwards and during it, um, and how like we see ourselves like change throughout that entire week. And I mean. For myself, uh, every night of reflection, I kind of just drew back on that one moment that I had with that person. And I mean, like, I just kept trying to like, um, see the bigger picture of that entire week. And uh, like, I did come to the realization that like, this community is amazing and I feel like the best version of myself when I'm with them and I would not have realized that otherwise if we hadn't done reflection. So like you learn a lot about yourself through it, um, mostly through just like being really vulnerable with yourself and with others and um, kind of just like going through like your daily motions and um, finding meaning from it, so. Thank you. Yep. Dennis. Oh shoot, sorry. <laughs> there are lots of things that a student might do on a fall break. So I, I'm backing Father Alexander's question up. At one prior step, what 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 are some of the motives that led some of you to just make the choice to spend fall break in this way? Why did you do this? <laughs> <laughs> well, 
for me, I'm from San Diego, California. So going home for a week and spending two to three hundred dollars doesn't really make sense just to spend there, just to stay there for a week. So my other alternative is to stay. I live in Degelman, so my other alternative is to stay in the basement 24/7 for that whole week. And so, be, a combination of not wanting to do that for a third time in a row, as well as the desire to actually do something that can actually help another family or another person, that was my desire for doing this service trip: is to do something with my life that actually matters, as opposed to sit in the basement and watch Netflix all day. <laughs> I also just want to say that I love going on the trips because even just like um, Kyle, I live in San Jose, California, and while it is also very expensive to go back, I think it's an absolute honor to go out and do service in our country. And in my Catholic faith, I was taught that Jesus came down to, to not be served, but to serve. And also going on these trips brings me closer to my faith, and I absolutely I'm just touched by all these great experiences that we're able to go through in my just education back in high school. I did about 100 service hours throughout my time there and I wish I could have done more. And having this opportunity is unbelievable because we get to see more of the country, we get to meet incredible people, learn great lessons, and we also get to serve and just become better, more capable adults, more ready for the life to come. So it was just an amazing experience and I would gladly do it again. I want to do it until I graduate. Over the years, I hear that this is not just an individual experience. You were not sent as individuals. You went as groups. Can anybody say something about why that was a powerful part of your experience, being with others on it? So I think what was most powerful about being with a group, just with like the Creighton community, but also in the community of our host site is I've already been saying the word a lot, but we have this pillar um, community, and that's really just coming together and um, making connections and doing things together, just a lot of like unity with that. And so um, what's really cool and unique about this program is we put, or the program puts um, students with people they don't know, maybe people they've never met before. On my first service trip, I had no idea any of those people existed, and I thought I knew so many people on Creighton's campus. Um, and it's cool because you can find similarities, find connections, um, just realize that you have a lot to, um, to offer for each other and then build relationships. And what's cool about building relationships is that it's just, they're always there. And um, with that host site that we went to, my first trip was El Paso and I'm so determined to go back and that was like two years ago um, in this Albuquerque community that I just went on the community there and the connections I made there, I feel like ties to it and I feel comfortable going back there and saying, hey, on one of my trips I went to Kansas City and I'm from the St. Louis area, so driving from Omaha to Kansas or to St. Louis, I drive to Kansas City and there's twice I've stopped by and said hi to the nuns that I stayed with. Just, it's really cool to have those ties. And then as for the, um, the Creighton students, it's just really cool to um, find common ground with them and then it just like, reaffirms at least my beliefs that like Creighton really is a special place and there's so many cool people here and just I feel like there's like a mold of like <laughs> that like God just like molds Creighton kids sometimes because they're so inspiring um, to give up a week of their time to you know watch TV or go home or you know go on a fun beach trip but they they choose it to serve and it's just really cool to find find these guys and make friendships with them I'm still really good friends with um, my first service trip and every trip I've gone on I've made just really really empowering relationships so yeah I think going with a group of people also make it adds new perspectives to the group um, for me San, uh, the part of San Diego that I come from it's not a small town at all there's a lot of people and so one, one of the guys that was in our in my group he was from a small town Griswold Iowa um, they have just, they have a little bit more of a population than Stroud does. And so he has a very good uh, knowledge of how a small town works. Um, he kind of knew what to expect. And so when it came to reflections, he would always bring up his small town and he would compare and contrast Stroud from Griswold. And it was just, um, it was just nice to have a new perspective. 
Um, I think the other factor of going with a group is that it shows the people that you go see how much people care about them, even if you don't know them. So, like, I'm pretty sure there's a saying of there's power in numbers. And to see that nine people would, out of however 10,000 Creighton kids, want to go down and spend their fall break helping not just one person, not one person from Creighton, but 10 people wanting to do this. It would just, it just brings those people that you work with to tears to see the generosity of the time, the generous amounts of time that a student would give to that, to that organization. Anything else anybody wants to say or ask? Is anybody available for adaption? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, I. Don't take lunch. Lunch or coffee invitation. Yeah, really. Um, could the team of the Schlegel Center for Service and Justice please stand up, please? And Kelly? Good. This is what they do, and uh, thank you. Uh, I think also what's really powerful is uh, I hope you students heard that you made a difference. For us, it confirms what we're here for, what we're trying to do, and uh, we're so very proud of you. So thanks a lot for doing this with us. God bless.